It's the fifth podcast of the Pioneer Technology Show in the land of bits and bytes, and we'll be talking about the technology industry, ICT industry, and the state of education has steered by the universities. With me on the show, we'll be hosting a distinguished ICT professional, James Wire, a regular panelist on the show. I think we'll start with the formalities for the first time. We'll be talking about books and education. So, James, which, which degree do you have, which master's degree do you have, and which undergraduate degree do you have? Um, uh, my undergraduate degree was in agriculture economics uh, from Makere, after which, uh, of course, I went into a self-study mode uh, to get into ICT. And then um, well, I, I got a couple of papers here and there, certificates, you know, hands-on best certifications, and uh, maybe a diploma that I got in 21st Century Telecoms from the UK. And then eventually I decided to go for an MBA for my master's, which is uh, uh, one of my most recent papers. Okay, could you try to attach some years to what we're talking about? Uh, we're talking about 1990-something, 96, I'm sure, right? Yeah, I see the first degree, I graduated uh, in 98. And then that's when the process began. But by that time, I already made up my mind I was going into IT. So I was already practicing, running around, trying to do whatever I could do. Okay, so before 2004, I, th I think that's around the time when we got the first faculty of computer science or faculty of IT. How were you people getting IT education? Which institutions were offering IT education? Or how were you people getting to you know, get the certificates that you talked about? I think prior to that, you had those who left the country yes. and got the IT degrees from universities in the UK, the US, you know, and they returned. There were quite a number in that category. Then you had those who had to rely on the local, we had training, computer training schools oh. from as far back as the late 80s, early 90s. Really? Yeah, nice. you get, remember when I was in my S4 vacation, I have a colleague that actually during the vacation went for computer training. And I admired her so much. I was like, oh, she's so lucky. Because by then talking about a computer was like talking about uh, a chance to go to the moon today, you know. Kind yeah, of but thing. I mean, I can imagine the computers in that generation were as huge as, you know, this studio room. I'm wondering which institution could afford such a computer besides Bank of Uganda? Because I thought Bank of Uganda like, had the first computer in around 1994 in Uganda. Yeah, no, but by, by, by the early 90s, the, the personal computer had really become yes. quite portable. Uh, but then you're right, the, 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 the training was expensive. You'd okay. pay probably 10 times what you pay today for a basic course on IT literacy. So you're talking about 15 million, 10 million around there? Okay. No, and your currency uh, was much. <laughs> yeah, but uh, by then money hadn't lost this much value. So again, it may appear small. So, all right, back to your student life as a student. How, how were you people on campus accessing computers, 1996? This is 2016, yeah. 20 years ago or it, 20 actually, yes. Campus was quite tough for many. I was only privileged that in the agriculture faculty, we had one of the few labs, computer labs that were available. But we used to see many students from other faculties really dying to get a chance to use our computers. And uh, so it was quite a hassle. Uh, most of the reading, for example, we had to do it from the library. Mm. The library used to be so full, looking for textbooks here and there. There was little you could use computers for apart from preparing project work. Okay. Nothing more. Uh, so those students that had interest always tried hook or crook to see that they sneak into a particular faculty that has a lab and they use the computers there viruses galore, you move with a floppy disk here and there. So it, it was quite a pain. But again, at the same time, yeah. the interest in computing wasn't as high as it is today. Yeah. Very few. In fact, a number of uh, some of our peers left the university without even Never using uh, a touching a computer. So well, I, can, I can imagine handing in coursework that is totally handwritten. I don't think I'll be able to pass that coursework. I own the, the worst handwritings <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Yeah, I, I see. So that's how you were finding life at campus without computers. Then the few of you who took an effort to move around the university, earlier on you told me you used to go to School of uh, Engineering or School of, back then I think it's a faculty, faculty. of Social Science now, and then School of Agriculture, the only ones who had computers. Yeah, um, Engineering and Agriculture, those were the two that mainly had. Then you also had the Department of Computer Science by then. 
which graduated into the current uh, uh, IEC yeah. or courses or okay. something. Yeah. Uh, so there were very few labs in the university. Other faculties, if you phone computers, it was probably in the office of the dean, you know, those administrative people. Okay. So, yeah, but also, I must say, the need, you know, the thirst and hunger for the computer wasn't as much as it is today. Mm. So even when you, for example, went back to your room, to, I mean, we had alternative forms of existing. Oh, I find that really hard to be. You're not I bothered mean, whether I need to be in touch with someone instant. This instant world has spoiled us. Yeah, okay. You'd making a phone call, say to your parents, you'd schedule and say, I'll call them on Tuesday and talk to them. Okay. Tuesday, you look for a payphone somewhere or, you, you know, you go to someone's office and you call them and talk to them or you write a letter. So oh, days life of was okay. You wait campus. for a month. You could afford to wait for a month to get a response. All right. I think life was really hard back in the day. So quick one. Um, how do you rate the graduates of today who have computers at their disposal all the time? I think many of them are spoiled for choice. Okay. Yeah. They have too much that they don't realize what they have. Okay. I'll give a personal example. Yes. To just to be able to get the skills I got, I used to moonlight. They would lock me in an office overnight okay. just for me to have a chance to access the internet and use an office computer. So while guys would go to Angenoa to dance on Friday evening, yeah. I would be in the office, and on Saturday morning, as the yeah. workers are coming mm. uh, to do the Saturday shift, yeah. I would walk out. So today, they are spoiled for choice. But again, I must say, uh, they also need some bit of guidance. Because usually when you have too much, I've seen to my children, yeah. uh, when they're exposed to too much around them, mm -hmm. they don't concentrate on one particular it's thing. Diverted. So usually, there's, there are lots of diversion. So that's what's probably has happened to kids of today. I want to do this. I want to do the other. This looks cool. Uh, cool guys are doing the other one. Let me try this. So they don't get focus eventually. And I think it is important that we have that brought up so they know that if I'm pursuing A, let it be A. I may want A, B, C, but for now, let me pursue A. Then once I've reached A, I can now bring in B. I also have reached B, I can now bring in C, and then I have A, B, C eventually. Well, it's also a blessing in this guys. I mean, fail once, uh, fail often, so they get to try out so many things, fail at them, and until when they zero down to that one thing, that gives them a better path in life. Yeah, but what I've learned in life also, mm. sometimes even if you fail, you need to put more time into something. That is very Yeah, true. expecting instant success is not always... Those are, those are fairy tales that remain in Hollywood. Okay, I see. Yeah. So you have been in the industry for some very long time. How do you think the academia, that's universities, how can they bridge the gap between them and the industry? Universities, uh, first of all, have a challenge in Uganda, at least. Uh, one, they have this legacy syllabi, okay. I must say, that take decades to adjust. And for industries like IT, three months is an IT year, a technology year. That is very true. Okay? So now, if you're going to rely on a syllabus that was designed in 2006 to teach a student today in 2015 at the university, believe you me, you're just trying to play catch up. That is true. Okay? So I don't know how to do it. I understand this will have challenges. You know, to change the syllabus, you have yeah. to go through procedures. NCDC, National Curriculum Development Center, has to yeah. approve. I don't know. All those organs are there. Which the good thing is that you can do ahead of time. I mean, um, and, uh, at least for my career, I'm sure back in the day, in my years, we could do three years. They do th the curriculum in three years. Every after three years, they update. But a lot of the time, they just copy and paste what they have seen out there and then put a new course unit instead of really... Uh, you know, changing stuff. And the other undoing is the same lecturer who taught the old-fashioned course is the same person going to teach this new fashion course. And it's just going to, you know, he's not really abreast with what they are well, teaching. Exactly. You find someone teaching uh, software engineering principles and still teaching waterfall model and stuff like that. That has really died off all over. And still, they don't even get the basics right of what is really happening there. So I think maybe we'll need to train new kind of, you know, there should also be getting new industry players to be lecturers, something like that? Yeah, so I think also another middle ground would be to promote a fusion. Okay. Today, to lecture at the university, I understand you must be having a PhD, yeah, you know. Master, and many of us industry guys don't have much time for some of those formalities. Yeah. To be honest, I did my MBA because I just wanted to have a paper to prove to guys that, look, I'm educated, and I can do whatever work. But otherwise, it didn't add much to me. I already knew what I was taught anyway. 
Uh, this was done from uh, New Orleans University? Yeah, in um, the US. Uh, <laughs> you can imagine. It, it, it's yeah. actually wasted my time because I think I could... I, this is I was being taught I knew months away. <laughs> you know? Anyway, um, so uh, uh, universities need to fuse. Why? Because when you have an industry expert yeah. being able to teach and relate with your students, there's a side of the picture they bring that is not resident in academia. Okay. In 2009, I had a chance with my colleague Chigundu, uh, Robert mm. Chigundu of okay. uh, Kimnet Saval. Okay. And uh, we did lecture, no, Chigundu Mukasa, not Robert, no, Chigundu ah, Mukasa. Mukasa. Seen the name online, actually. Yes, yeah. we did have a chance to lecture the faculty of computing by then. And um, it was a three months engagement. And by the time we finished, our stint, I could see the change that had occurred in the students. And many of them, when we were starting off, we set expectations and we realized that the most they had been taught in class yes. by academia was what is Linux? You know the, the theory, what is this? And yes. then it's one, two, three History commands on the blackboard. Oh, God. Yeah, that's On true. the blackboard. That is true. We went to a three months intensive theory stroke practical kind of training. And by the time we finished it, we had guys who were good enough to start a career in systems administration and networking. Just a plus on that, uh, system administration is the most sought after career in IT in Uganda. World over, it should have been called, should be called DevOps, I think. Yes. And yeah. it's taking over. But in Uganda, if you really want wanted to get a job three years back, five years back, you needed to have a career in to really understand system administration, and you either have to choose between Linux or Windows. I had forgotten to ask a question. What computers were you running back in the day? Was it Linux or Windows back in 96? And no, they were basically Windows 3.0, 3.1. You know, you boot through DOS. Now, after you type Win, you get to Windows, ah. and Windows comes on board, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the first time I came across Linux was around 99. Okay. Did you have, uh, would you guys afford, would the university be able to afford Windows, like, Windows licenses, or it, there was no licensing option. Who was back buying then? licenses at that time? Ah, I thought, uh, okay. Even I the laws my... were not favoring any copyright. Okay, they were, they were there, but still were too over, weak. Okay. Yeah, no one was buying licenses in Uganda, at least at that time. Uh, no one buys licenses in challenge. Uganda, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so we had, uh, did we have Microsoft Word, Excel, or spreadsheet programs? Yes, they we... had. You had the likes of Lotus 1, 2, 3. Ah, I don't yeah. know if it's still there. It's still dead company, yeah. though. Yeah, you know, quite a, yeah, they were there. You really had. Uh, Microsoft came on board with many of those alternatives later. Yeah. There were original guys who were into those fields initially, and then mm. they somehow... They really off. beat the rest of the guys at their game, I remember. Yeah. Do you have, like, PowerPoint? What was, there, was there anything like a presentation software back in the day? I didn't do much. By then, I didn't have any need. But I remember Publisher, oh. which I used to use to design uh, uh, leaflets at the ah, university and because. things like that. Yeah, I think the, the, the softwares were there, but it depends on whether you'd have access it or not. Yeah, sure. So I didn't have any need for presentations. So. Okay. So were you guys back in the day making money off that, off your computer skill during university? Because right now, I like I made a bunch of millions of shillings when I was still a student before the folks who are doing other courses. I mean, <sighs> as um, because the little that you learn from a school of computing all the way from first year can be able to, you know, earn you a few dimes from, you know, designing a website, brochures, graphic designing, animation. You know, you can try out so many things before you even leave college. So were you guys using that, some of your skill set to make money? To be honest, we didn't really make money as such. Those people who made money were doing it, typing, helping someone type their project and uh, things like that. But uh, there wasn't really that much that now I'm doing this. I think it was more of passion driving some of us, yeah. that inquisitiveness. Yeah. I want to know this computer better. I want to know it more and more. And eventually it became a profession. So you talked about Silicon Valley, uh, rather the U.S. Uh, were you in any chance next to Silicon Valley when you were there? I did uh, in 2000, uh, 99. I was too early. In 99, uh, my, my first time to leave this country, I went to the Silicon Valley, actually. Ah, great stuff. Man. Yeah, and I spent almost a month there training, uh, Cisco-related networking and stuff mm. like that. It oh. was already a beehive of activity. You were training, getting training or training? I was getting training. Oh, I thought yeah, you I was getting were. training. I was still a young guy. I thought you were the first expert. Naive to... guy. I would mm. probably have stayed there because I'd got offers to stay, but I said, no, Uganda is better. Anyway, um, Silicon Valley, I must say, has its strength. It does a lot. It has revolutionized computing world over. Yeah. And I, I do admire them a lot. 
But uh, I think as Uganda, we yeah. don't necessarily need to start looking at Silicon Valley as is. Yeah. Because we have our challenges that slightly differ okay. from what the American challenges are. We have our environment that differs greatly from what yeah. the environment is the other side. So many times if we try to take on an approach with the assumption that they did it this way in Silicon Valley yeah. so we can replicate it, you are building your house on sand. Ah. When I hear guys saying, oh, Silicon, Savannah, Nairobi, and yes, to yes. me, that is crappy talk. All right. Let's get real. We can do a Silicon Valley kind of thing here, yes. but it has to be something that has its roots foundation. founded here. You saw like the BPO in Kenya 10 years ago. Yes. They were blowing around. Oh, BPO, BPO, Kenya, BPO, Ghana, BPO. Those industries are practically on their knees today. Yeah, true. Why? Because the way they were founded, they were on the premise of how BPO is being done in America. Yes. But at least India okay. managed to, you know, do it really well. India it started from down, ground up. Uganda, which was a little slower towards getting to that direction, yes. seems to be making a lot more progress today than even the Kenya, which pioneered way back. Why? Because here it was thought out from bottom up. As opposed to an American coming here and setting up a big BPO franchise, mm. and then they start claiming Uganda BPO. Because that's what happened in Kenya and in, in Ghana. Mm. When yeah. those white guys failed to uh, continue pushing their entities, things started going down. Okay, so people actually often refer to Kamocha as the Silicon Valley of Uganda. Yeah, but you notice that Kamocha just, a, a lot of the companies in Kamocha just build software for government, public sector. We never have productivity tools by a startup in Uganda, you know, on the market. We don't have a WhatsApp that's coming from Uganda. We don't have a Facebook coming from our Silicon Valley. Why do you think we don't build productivity tools? We just build health applications for competitions and stuff like that. I think let's appreciate the fact that in Africa, not only Uganda, yes. you want to first be able to have food to eat yeah. before you can start thinking of all these fancy things we talk about. So let's also understand that the guys in Kamocha, by the way, yeah, you can call that a you know a Silicon Valley of sorts because that's where I had an office there years back. Guys have to first survive. So where is the money? Government spending in the IT industry today, yes. 66% of the of the revenue generated come from government. So you need to first see that you make some money, and then you can start wishful thinking. The Mark Zuckerbergs of this world, if they didn't have school fees to pay at university, would they have had enough time and bandwidth to mm. be able to innovate the way they are innovating? Yeah, but they dropped out of university somehow. And you so can see he had a home to go to. Yes. Here do you drop out and see whose house you'll stay in. <laughs> Did you get this kind of yes. things? We've had a bunch of Ugandan dropouts that have been so okay. I'm not advising someone to really drop out of school. Yeah. But I think right now it's a very globalized world. If you can build that one application that you know can change the face of the continent or yeah. the world or your country, I believe you can be able to make money. Yeah, but what I'm trying to say here is eh, they have started from somewhere. Yes. Now I think the next level, now that they are, they've been able to prove their abilities by doing software for government and a few businesses here and there, Maybe now that's the next level that they have to go to. And it's good you're pointing it out. Challenge yes. them. I think someone will do something. All right. I am very sure the geeks out there are working on something in the space just to disprove some of us, the cynics. <laughs> A lot of people are very cynical about tools that come out of Uganda because we've barely built any product. We don't have any productivity tools on the market right now. I know a bunch of my friends are coming up with a, an app. I think it's Easy Border. Very great application. Uh, it's a border... It's the an amber like kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You can be able to get a border just at the click of, of the your phone. of your phone. And there's another Sasula. So many applications right there. Uh, so uh, why do you think Nairobi is the tech hub of Eastern Central Africa, Lagos to Nigeria, Egypt to North Africa, and then uh, I think Johannesburg is to South Africa. Why do you think? Why, why isn't it Kampala, where we have one of the best universities in the world, churning out this number four thousand graduates like every year? Yeah, I think it goes beyond just IT. Yeah. Look at Nairobi. Yes. Look at Kenya first as a country. Okay. Uh, over the years, it has established itself as one a highly capitalistic economy yes. that attracts lots and lots of investment in different sectors of the economy. Okay. okay? So now. For a big company to come, for example, uh, one time when I was helping one of the companies that wanted to come, was making a choice between either Uganda or, or Kenya. Kenya yeah. One of the things they told me why they would have loved Nairobi, yes. one, easy connection. 
Okay, what's, what, what do they mean? Is the Practically, you can fly from any city anywhere, and at most there are two hopes. Oh, yeah, that makes <laughs> you get sense. To Nairobi. Yes, yes, that's very true. You know, uh, oh, one hope. Then two, they look at the size of the economy. Okay, wow. Okay, three, they look at the already existing international agencies there. Because also they, they are coming to do business, okay? So there, there are lots of things that contribute to that. So now Kampala, of course, Uganda, it's understandable in our history, we made a lot of mistakes, fighting here and there, this and the other, while others were progressing. Okay. So now we are just playing catch up. But you know, you can see that we're also not very badly off because some companies are strategically coming to Kampala. Yes, true. And there are also other advantages you can look at. For example, security-wise, Kampala is way far better than Nairobi. Yeah, lately. <laughs> without doubt, by the way. No, that one I know, without doubt. Yeah. Sec- yeah, a lot of the time people just think Uganda is not safe because of Kony. Like people out there just feel uh, Gulu is very, or Arua is very next to Kampala. Like if you talk yes. to uh, someone in the Western world, that's what they always think. Yes. So Kampala also has its advantages. And as long as we air them out well, yeah. once we market ourselves well, yeah. it should be possible to keep getting more and more guys coming over. Okay. You yes. point out one of them, the largest IT school in the region is here. Is here, yeah. So these are things that need to be blown out there. We don't blow. We do things here and we keep quiet. Oh. The Kenyans go around shouting. Yeah, we've they done know this, to blow we've their done trumpet. that. However small they are. Yes, that, that, that is very true. Because actually, if you look at the companies there, we have Google in Kenya before it even came to Uganda. We have IBM there. We have Microsoft HP. there. HP as well. Mm. I'm jealous of yeah, but I mean, look at all those companies and, you know, what we have in Uganda. Besides ThoughtWorks, and uh, I think Laboramas Oslo has, we barely have Grameen Foundation. We barely have, like, those huge software firms or hardware firms. If these guys really have HP there, then, I mean, they're even getting into hardware. So Yeah, but the story is changing now. Because with a company like ThoughtWorks here, yeah. I'm sure their peers will ask them, how is the environment like in Uganda? And that could start encouraging the others also to Put consider. To shop. That makes sense. Yeah, talking about uh, ThoughtWorks, um, why do you think um, why do you think is that a few companies have decided to come to Uganda and forego Nairobi, even when they had a choice of Nairobi, specifically in ThoughtWorks? Like a lot of my peers were debating on the reasons why ThoughtWorks is in Uganda and not Nairobi. If you look at the the, ex- the reasons you gave, are clearly the, the the Kenyan market was clear cut thought choice for a company like ThoughtWorks. I think if you're thinking purely business, then Nairobi is a clear-cut winner. But if you start looking at things beyond just mere business, especially from the visionary perspective of the business owner, okay, okay, uh, then Uganda can have its advantages. For example, the fact that we have a large pool of uh, students to tap into here. Yes. And these are students not only Ugandans, but, but you talk of Tanzanians, Kenyans, Kenyans, even Zambians, Zambians, all there from Nigeria. Mm. They are all around this area called Kampala yes. studying here. That to me is a very, very big advantage. Okay? So if any company that wants to tap into that kind of talent mm. would rather position itself here. But also secondly, uh, Nairobi could be a congested area already. So to go there, you are just playing catch up or you are being an also me. So sometimes for the type who wants to trailblaze, yes. you say, okay, I won't go to Nairobi, I'll go to Kampala, I will start something, and before you know it, others will be following me there. So the trailblazer would look at Uganda, you know? And then there, there, there are also other, it could even be political reasons. Okay. Some people are like, oh, these guys, they're, they're kind of political line, I'm not, because even these business owners, they yes. have, their political inclination. Yes, philosophy. So if they are not inclined towards whatever is being practiced in a particular country, yes. then they will choose another one over that particular country. Well, well, well said there. Is there any possibility, do you see any ICT opportunities or services or products that can be built in Uganda and they can be able to be exported out to Kenya, Africa, or even the world at large that no, not a single person out there can be able to come up with such stuff? Brazil has been able to do a bunch of, you know, softwares that are, you know, that are used world over, you know. We had an example of, I think, a microfinance software done by uh, Crystal Clear Software. This is a company that makes about $5 million US dollars from just one software. It's a Ugandan company uh, by Ugandan developers, but they make up to like $5 million US dollars worth of revenue every year. Do we have such opportunities that you would give, you know, the listeners out there? Galore. 
people. What is that? Many. Okay. Um, I may not point them out this and the other, but yes. the one thing I would like to advise anyone, yes, yes. especially you're in IT, software development, whatever, leave the confines of your IT. Leave the confines of that hub where you are. Leave the confines of that bedroom where you develop from. Take time. Okay. Move out there. Go to the villages. Yeah. See people's day-to-day -day lives. Move to the slums. Wherever you are going to find problems that need technology solutions. And Uganda is no different from most African countries. Yes. Chances are, if something works here, it can very easily work in Kenya. Yes. You saw mobile money. Yes, definitely. How it became a runaway success. Okay. You have the history of mobile money. Like people say it's Safaricom uh, got the product from someone. I've met a bunch of Ugandans who claim they, they had the idea and launched it someone failed and then it was taken on. Do you have any history on... on to be honest with mobile money, Investor. there are lots of theories. Yeah. But the most credible one I found actually was that mobile money first started in the Philippines. Okay. That's the most credible information I've been found that, and be able to verify. The rest are just rumors and here, yeah, this one or this guy did this, the other. So I cannot speak based on rumors. rumors. But if you want credible information, just Google mobile money Philippines. You'll find that way back, I think at the turn of the century, yes. they had it going. Although it didn't pick up like that, it picks up here. Okay, so if you want to really do something that's going to turn this world around, especially uh, as an African developer, yes. get to understand the community you're in. I know many of these guys are curious. They want to do something, but they are confined by their experiences. They are confined by their exposure. That's why you'll see you'll do a border app today. Another one will do a ticketing app for people sure. to, to buy, to go to Kiria's show. Yeah. Uh, because that's what they're exposed to. Yeah. But there is a lot more just beyond the natural confines they're in. Take a hike around the country. How many have been to Gulu, for example? How many have been to Moroto? How many have been to Arua? That's just go. Cool. Just take a bus ride with even no plan. That and is... go see, interact. Go to a hotel. See the inconvenience you go through to be booked into the hotel. That is very true. You know, all that, you start getting ideas. Well, that's true. Oh, a lot of Ugandans don't really travel. Or if their version of, you know... Hanging out is in a bar. We don't really go to like safaris. Or, yeah. And that stuff is really cheap, I guess. Yeah. Just, just taking a hike to, to Arua, for example, a bus ride, 50,000. Then you spend a week there. You move around in the areas, the villages, whatever. You will come back with loads of potential ideas. It could be in agriculture. Yeah. It could be in health. Yeah. It could be in different sectors. Yeah, just my last one uh, for the listeners as well. They need to know that... Um, a uh, technology solution is not about that mob shiny mobile app. It could be something as simple as, you know, using USSD. As long as the use case of your target client here, the guy's going to use your software really, you know, can be able to interact with your application very freely and not just mobile application. Because you look at, uh, we have about, from a credible source, we say we have about 750,000 smartphones in Uganda. And then we have about uh, 2.4 million Ugandans who try to access the internet. We have 850,000 pe 850, people who access Facebook. So, I mean, you should be able to build a tool that millions of people should be able to use instead of confining yourself to uh, an Android solution that probably you have to rewrite one for every version of Android, plus forgetting Apple, Microsoft, so many variations. You could just build some simple USSD application. Uh, the other is how can someone, you know, keep abreast, you know, on top of their game in this ever-evolving ICT industry? I think once keep, keep learning, keep relearning. Uh, things like, uh, I don't know if you, they are, they are, if you get to hear of conferences, workshops, I encourage guys, go out there. They could be in Nairobi, they could be in Tanzania. Get ready to sacrifice, get ready to spend your money to attend. If you are sponsored, well and good. But to me, I believe a lot of knowledge is got through such networking events. Yeah. If you wait until you're going to do a particular degree to get certain knowledge, yeah. you'll wait forever. But these short things, you go for a one-week stint in Nairobi, yes. even if it's going to Jinja and there's a workshop of programmers or you, uh, UX guys, that kind of thing, yes. you keep getting bits and pieces. And then also it's important to know when to drop off some things. Okay, wow. Know when to drop off some things. Some people want to stick to everything. For me, for example, today you can't call me to set up a network and I will come. No. 
Where even however much money the other one I can leave now for the other guys, let them do. However, if you want it to be designed and you know, kind of I can do the design on paper, say okay, pay me for this, but go get so and so and they'll do the actual uh, Just a quick one. Do we have a lot of money in the in the cons- ITC consultancy field? Is there a lot of is there money in the ICT consultancy field? Because the young people out there don't get the chance to, you know, be asked to consult on some of these things and how can someone position themselves to become a consultant? How can someone in ICT position themselves to be consulted? I think you grow into consultancy. Okay. By first of all, initially offering solutions to customers. They, once they win your trust, they'll keep coming back to you. As they come back to you, they refer yeah. you to other people. Now, before you know it, yes. people are now consulting you. It, it, so whatever you're doing today, yes. do it to the best of your abilities, yes. to the satisfaction of your customers. They are the ones who are going to propel you. To that point. No one will just come from anywhere and picky, picky, punky and just pick you up and say, this consultant. Sometimes the kind of work we get, if a guy who you did work for 10 years ago says, okay. in Uganda, I know so and so. When you reach there, go look for him. If ah. not, let me introduce you via email. That's what happens. Because you did a good job 10 years ago. So it's very important to make sure the work you do, you do it well, yeah. you're honest. Believe you me, you'll build a network of people around you that believe in you. I hope you got it from there. Foundation, that you have to build a very good foundation. You have to have a very good network and you have to do your job really well if you get time to do it because there are a lot of people out there who can do stuff that you do. A lot of times, and every IT guy feels they're the god of their industry. Like, I have friends of mine, like, they always feel that they're the best, they're the best at this, this particular thing and sometimes they end up under-delivering thinking they're god of the mm-hmm. kind of industry. It's so, a phase in life. Uh, they will outgrow it. So you, uh, you are an ICT visionary from, I mean, everyone who's listening can be able to tell that. How, where do you see the industry in Uganda, particularly for the next five, 10 years, or even two years, because it's ever changing? I think an assessment of the industry requires looking at it from different spectrums. One, there is a perspective of the middle class, okay. it's corporates, you know, the urban dwellers, wannabes, mm. and all like, those. Could you just give us the urban okay. dwellers and then that and nom- then that person you always want to represent on the show? <laughs> for, for the urban dwellers, to be honest, yeah. I see a lot of uh, things rotating around data. Okay. Okay. In the next five years, different things, but they'll be rotating around data. So do you, do you mean like big data? Do you mean open data? Or, okay, anything data is going anything to be Anything data? Yeah. Because, you know, innovations are innovations. I yeah. can't say, oh, this is going to happen exactly. Someone, I know people are out there cooking their heads, thinking of what to do, and they will surprise us. But data is going to play a very, very big role. Right. It has already begun, you can see. And if you look, for example, at the coming, upcoming elections, you will yes. see that all of a sudden there's a lot of keen interest in yeah. trying to capture the social media Oh, yes. Presence by meaning guys, that's yes. all under data. I don't want to do a kalango, but I yeah. think I'll, I'm going to be very, um, I would be consultant in that field. I'll plan to do a lot of data science initiatives for the elections. Yes. But only I'm doing about data in Uganda is things can't really go your way. I mean, there's several factors that can play, you know, key to some of those things. For example, I would think, like in the US, they can be able to do a bunch of visualizations on how a certain state will vote. I don't think you have that power to do such a thing in Uganda. Someone will be given a kilo of sugar the previous night, a bowl of soap, and they'll change their mind instantly. Whereas for the U.S., someone looks at a policy and see if it applies to their states or favors them, uh, and, you know, they'll vote because of that. So I don't know. We should try to do our best, I guess. That's mm. one of the part of the challenges you have to overcome. Okay. But also, uh, now on the other side of the spectrum, when you look at the mm. layman, the peasants in the villages and all that, um, they are actually going to I'm become nice. more technology savvy than they are today. Uh, because when we, when we look at them, we may think that, oh, well, the guy has not used a computer before, the guy didn't understand this and the other. Mm. But as technology becomes simpler, yes. and even with things like localization of technology oh, taking is, place, that is true. we are going to see technology becoming a basic in the rural areas. And one, and in the next five years, things that we thought were confined to urban areas will become commonplace in these villages. Well, localization is very key. People need to understand. I don't know. People need to port some of these things to different languages, at least yes. to the major languages. Because let me give you one quick example. Whenever I go up country, yes. and even sometimes in Kampala here, you find 
a person in the ATM helping other people access money. Oh yeah. Okay? Ugly. Now to me, when I think technologically, I'm like, why are we sleeping? Guys are fighting, I need to make the next mobile app. Just come up with an ATM that will speak to someone in their language. I don't think it's hard. It's not hard, actually. It's, you we see, haven't, you know. <laughs> no, let's try and think beyond yeah. the mobile, 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 mobile. There are lots of things. An ATM I punch in, if I can't even remember my PIN code, maybe I just thumb in, yeah. and then it knows that this thumbprint speaks Lunyole, then it says Kojeo, and I say Julio Pebesa, and it gives me money. That, that's not hard. I know it's not hard. That is true. That's not hard. Okay? So there are lots of other things that can be done that can reach out to that peasant out there, or, or rather the rural dweller, not necessarily a peasant, but a rural dweller. So mm. the next five years, it is such things that will redefine and they will be interlinked with the desire by many of these businesses yeah. to reach the untapped markets. So I hope you, the geeks out there, can hear this. You have to be very inclusive in the ideas that you work on because i mean the market is out there maybe you who knows maybe an ngo would give you a grant just to work on such a solution they you know that users don't have to necessarily pay and then you uh, the other on the other on your phone you are still competing with global bigger players like you know if you're coming up with a social network you're competing with facebook i imagine you have this social network for Peasants who are farmers. I don't know if it's a reputation. I think a farmer is a peasant. Not necessarily. By the <laughs> way, they know. are very rich farmers. You won't believe how much they earn. <laughs> yeah, but you could have that application, you know, that bridges, you know, sellers of maize and whatever it is. And you don't have worldwide competition like yeah. you would have on, you know, that's this kind of thing that uh, people at your university use. Uh, just a reminder, apps like for the Facebooks you hear about, it's not necessarily the software excellence that makes them. No. But really makes sense. There is a lot more that goes on behind the scenes in terms of understanding human interaction, in terms of understanding psychology of people, in terms of understanding what to present to them. There is a lot more. So you may have the ability to design something technically more competent than Facebook yes. in terms of software code, but that's not what makes it a success. That is true. And you see, the, the beauty of these things you have to understand is these guys work on like in teams or oh, people bridge experiences like for example look at uh, facebook uh, mark zuckerberg is a psychology student like he had a background in psychology mixed it up with computer science actually if you listen to him he's more of a psychologist than a computer scientist and that's how he was able to do this beautiful thing called facebook if he was just a computer science 311 he would definitely couldn't have really pulled it off the way he did all right this is the last question how would you, as a parent or as a, an academic, someone who has been in the academia, have a bachelor's degree, you have a master's degree, how would you test a student's ability to do critical thinking? I personally like testing uh, students or children through scenarios. Yeah, this uh, one plus one equals two to me is uh, archaic because it just encourages people to become robots. But scenario setting, uh, especially scenarios that take them by surprise, or scenarios with a few tweaks here and there to determine someone's level of concentration can give you a very good idea of someone's abilities. Uh, many times you find people, they have all these nice, lovely papers, very high grades and all that, but put something there, break it a little bit, it could be a computer on a network, just tweak the software a little, and then you see them sweating for 10 hours just to get a solution, then you know, ah, okay, this is a level at which... So I, I like scenarios, to be honest. But also the other thing is interactions. Yeah, there are some people who may not necessarily be good today, but they have the potential to be good tomorrow. So through interactions, you can be able to tell that there is a future for this one. I once got such a candidate, and uh, I gave her an opportunity to work. Today, she's a very big name in the circles. I don't know if it's worth mentioning her name now, but... Uh, if, if, I mean, if she's big and you know, our listeners would love to know and get inspired. Uh, she's actually, you've heard of Namara Evelyn. Evelyn Namara. Oh, yeah. I yes. mean, everyone yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good stuff there. Yeah. So in, in short, the last uh, uh, example you gave us was, you know, critical thinking. Um, that slightly tailored it to a question of who is the ideal candidate for a, a job in technology? Do they have to have the kung fu of having papers like, you know, a first class degree in computer science, or you want as someone who can really get the job done? If you walk through that door and come here, 
and I'm, I'm doing a technology interview. Yes. Throw your papers in the corner. All right. I don't even want to hear which university you've been to. Okay. I don't even care. And it's you, the individual. I have seen really, uh, you know, chaps that Mutambuze, for example, whatever his real name is. Yeah. <laughs> Mutambuze, yeah, yeah. forgive me, but uh, he's anyway. called. Uh, you I know. forget his name. Felix Chitaka. Yes, Felix. You know, no university degree, but sit down. What we want in the world today is to get work done, not to have flowery things, you know, and become uh, full of makeup. And Many of these papers are just makeup on the face. Yes. Once the makeup is washed away, you get, you know, a very ugly sight. Right. Mutambuze yeah. Felix, those who don't know him, is he's just recently come, he comes up with applications like in about six hours, you can have a fully working application. I think last week he had an application that, you know, determines a smile, telecom, internet usage. In six hours, he had an application up and running, desktop application top-of-the-line application, like something that would take you forever to write in a company, something that Smile didn't think about or didn't have time to hire someone to do it. So we have people who can really get the job done. So in short, what James Ware says is uh, um, your kung fu is not in the papers, your kung fu is in the hands and what you can get done. Without uh, doubt. Yeah, I think we ha we're coming to the close of the show. Uh, James, what are your closing remarks? My closing remarks, I want to say that uh, there is a lot of opportunity out there uh, let's desist from the bickering we keep, we keep in, in circling ourselves in. Yeah. Government hasn't done this. They have not given me the other. They will give you each and everything, but you still keep coming up with new excuses. Today, someone complains about transport in the country and the other. Believe you me, what we already have, even if we may want more, but what you already have is enough. If you have been educated and you have a degree, stop kicking yourself around saying they haven't given me a job. Try out something unique. Try out something strange. You'll laugh all your way to the bank eventually. So let's just be focused. Let's think out of the box, if there's a box anywhere. Yes. And then let's try and utilize all this knowledge you've acquired while growing up. Many of you, I know, don't have much exposure because you're Kampala kids. You've grown up here around the city. You don't even know what the village looks like. This is the time. Start going beyond the confines of the city. And that is the only way you're going to come up with solutions that transcend your current understanding and environment. Uh, good to hear. I'm city born, city bred, grew up in Kansanga, used to play on City <laughs> Square, Clock Tower, I think. Villa Park has its cheering hall. Uh, so you can catch us on techjaja.com slash, I think, podcast. You could look up the podcast. This is our fifth podcast. You can also catch me on Twitter at Rob Sebunya. Catch me on Facebook at Sebunya Robert and uh, James. At Wire James. At Wire James. What about the blog? Wirejames.com. Yes, you can, you can check up a blog. He blogs quite widely about agriculture, technology, and any random thing that, you know, he has on top of his mind. Thanks for listening into the show. I was Robert Sebunya and James Wire. Weary Wire. Which one should we go for for this show? The last show you had a correction here and there. Weary. Weary. But with an eye. Yes, with an eye. It was a pleasure. <laughs> See you guys in the future. <laughs>